Hi, I'm Father Louis Skirt, and I welcome you to Friends of the Word. This is a beautiful day. It is the Feast of the Most Blessed Trinity, the core of our faith. Thank you for joining us, and pass this on to your family and friends. And let me hear from you, Father Lou Skirty at Hotmail.com. And as you contact me, the bells will ring. God bless you. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the Spirit of truth will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. He will glorify me because he will take from me what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. For this reason I told you that he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, at the end of the final Mass of the day, the Paschal candle was extinguished, symbolizing the end of the Easter cycle, and Pentecost ends the 50 days of Easter. So the next day, Monday, we begin ordinary time. So we are really in ordinary time of the year. However, I'm wearing white, we're singing hallelujahs. Why? Because we're jump-starting our faith in a sense, again. We're starting with two basic elements of our faith that are so important this week and next week. Today we celebrate the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And next week we celebrate the Eucharist, both foundations of our faith, so important in everything we do, our daily lives, our coming to church, our charity. So important that we celebrate them beginning our ordinary time, just sort of knowing basically what's the goal of ordinary time, to be united with God. What's the goal of ordinary time? To be nourished on the Eucharist. Next week we'll focus on the Eucharist. But as we think about the Holy Trinity, three in one, We could, if we were doing a class, going through the documents that go back to the first century. We can use some of the sections that we heard in Scripture, especially Paul's letter. We could do many, many things. We could look at the councils that that fought with each other about what is God and how is he coming across as Father, Son, and Spirit. And we could thank all of those theologians and those councils who came up with and eventually developed our present concept of God. They didn't make it up. They gleaned it from the scriptures and from the faith of the church. But it's funny because when you you search for something, sometimes the first answer you get is not the right answer. You ever lose something? And once you found it, you stop looking, right? It's that. That concept, once they found it, they, being theologians and the study of the church through centuries, found it, it was like an aha moment. Look what's there. It's been there from the beginning, the concept of three-in-one God. So we're not, we're not going to develop that theology. We're not going to look at the scripture affirming that. But let's look at our application of the Holy Trinity in our lives. And we might use it for our sake as a model of the family. Elements of it coming from 
Pope Francis' recent letter, Amoris Letizia, which means the joy of love. And I use some of the examples that he gave in that. Some of the elements of a family, some of the elements of the Trinity, lifelong fidelity, promise keeping, sacrifice for the beloved. That ordinary in family, but extraordinarily we model our family life on the Holy Trinity. And we see those elements in the Holy Trinity. There is a beautiful painting, one of my favorite, of the, of the icon style by Rubilov, Andrei Rubilov in the 15th century. And it is a painting that is called the Trinity, but basically it's a painting depicting something happening in the Old Testament when Abraham and Sarah were married and they had no kids and they were elderly. And the custom was if someone came by your house or your, your tent, as they were nomads, you offer them hospitality. First thing you do, you invite them in, you give them a drink, you sit them down, give them food, and you relax. So this is happening. Of course, Sarah, we're in a, a very patriarchic uh, uh, period. Sarah, the wife, is waiting on the guests, and there are three guests, and Abraham is chatting with them. They say to Abraham, you know, we're going to pass by again next time we come on our way going home. And we want to give you a promise that we're going to make to you. This is three men. Who are they? I don't know. When we come back the next time, your wife is going to be pregnant. And now Sarah was in the next room preparing food and she smiled and laughed. She's like elder. I don't know her age. She was elderly beyond normal childbearing age. And she smiled, and in, in the word smile in the Aramaic is she showed her teeth. That's the equivalent of smiling. So she showed her teeth. Okay, showing your teeth is called Isaac. Guests come back, a return trip, and she's pregnant. Abraham gives hospitality to those three and they go off into history. But scripture scholars have said, you know, there was something about in the scriptures of Exodus and Genesis, when these figures were described, they were described as one, although there were three. I, they said, you, singular, he was appointing. So the scripture scholars use that as one of the earliest depictions in scripture of the Trinity. The three acting as one. Okay, miraculous power. Now, the painting, you gotta go home and look for it, Rublov, 15th century, icon of the Trinity. Painting depicts three characters sitting at a table. They look somewhat like angels. And one is gazing at the other. So when Rublov, 15th century, paints this, he paints the gaze, one to the other. And in the distance, you see the little tent with Sarah. Our Pope Francis picks up on that word, gaze. And he uses it in his encyclical, his, his, his exhortation on Amoris Laetitiae, and he, he talks about the significance of the gaze that we have for one another and how reflective that gaze for one another can reflect our faith in God who gazes at us. We're not calling him looking, we're not talking about the clarity of the eyesight. Gaze, being present to each other. And... He also, uh, Francis, also reminds us that when we are gazing at each other in love, we're respecting the uniqueness of him or her, the person. We're respecting his or her attitude. We're respecting who they are. Color, race, doesn't matter. Whether we are in an intimate relationship or a global relationship with the person. We're respecting his or her uniqueness if we are gazing at one another with love. The love that we have from God the Creator. And as we gaze at each other, in a sense, 
we're respecting each other, and again, in Francis' words, we respect each other not as disposable items, which regrettably he, he uses in reference to relationships in our world. How some people are disposable, insignificant. He's not doing it my way, get rid of him. They're not my color, kill them. Disposable items. But he gets to the heart of what it means to gaze from the eyes and perspective of God at one another with love, with respect. And those of us who love one another can, can really accept that. That when I look at my child, if I'm married, when I look at my spouse, my beloved, there's something going on between us that's very special. It's love. And God is love. And God has given us that relationship and that ability to gaze lovingly at each other and to assist and work with each other. And that kind of love is mature. As we look at the, the uniqueness of the Father staring at the Son, the Son staring at the Spirit, the Spirit staring at the Father in the painting, we understand the unity of it, of the Trinity. We understand the unity of the family or family relationships that we are in. If you're in a relationship with another person, that's your family. Whether it is your same name, biological, long distance, we're one. God has blessed us with this gift. As we celebrate the Trinity, we celebrate ourselves in a sense because it's an opportunity to re-look, re-gaze at one another and appreciate the uniqueness of each other. And again, yes, with your beloved, of course, but also with the poor, also with the immigrant, also with those for whom we're collecting food. I see the baskets of food being accumulated at the side door. And maybe directly you don't gaze at those poor who receive those packages, but in those boxes of cereal and, and cornflakes and, and pasta, you are gazing in relationship with the poor, and that is bringing you and me in relationship to God. God who is love. It, we're not just collecting food or, or asking for donations at any, uh, during any crisis or any, any earthquake. We're not just doing that for the sake of taking care of the, the incident, whatever it is, whether it's a, a burnt house or an earthquake. We're doing it to reflect our love for one another. As we gaze at the poor, as we gaze at the wealthy, as we gaze at the politician, as we gaze at, at, at those who are being fed at Eva's Kitchen. And that gaze is significant because it's a wi window, you might say, into the heart of God. As we love one another, it doesn't stop there at the person you see or the person you're serving. It goes to God. And it's one, once again another interesting depth to the relationship of the Trinity. It is a relationship. God teaches us relationship. And that unity, I didn't create it. God gives it to us through Scripture, and we, we've developed appreciation of it through the centuries. But wow, you mean when I'm loving another person, I'm interacting with God? Yes, whether it's intimately sexually or picking up a little child and throwing him up in the air, changing his diaper. It doesn't matter. You are interacting with God, who is love. Gets right there, doesn't he? And I apologize for using the male pronoun. God gets there, doesn't God? And it's, we have a tendency to make God male, female. God is God. There is no gender except when Jesus was born. And of course, Jesus comes to us, and what does he do? He gives us the opportunity to contemplate God. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity meaning that we come before God in all of his essence, in all of God's essence. And the scriptures give us it from, from beginning to end, from, from creation, from the book of Proverbs, God depicting wisdom, wisdom being the there with God, reminding us, hey, wait a minute, whatever you're thinking of, 
I was there, I created the earth, the foundations, I created the sky. We're talking about that, the sublimeness of God, the transcendence of God. So the scriptures give us an idea that we want to put ourselves in the presence of God. We're uniting ourselves with that which is beyond what we can even imagine. However, God interrupts time and comes to us as a human being. So from the sublime to the human, Jesus Christ, God is available to us. If we imitate Jesus Christ in the physical needs and love of one another, we're imitating God. If we sit in prayer and say, God, I have nothing to say to you, but I want you to be with me, or, or, or I, I don't have the right words, that's all right, just be in the presence of God. Let God do the work, inspiring you to think about anything you need to think about and take care of whatever you need to take care of in our lives. We're celebrating the uniqueness of our faith, the triune God, the three in one. And, and as we see that as a relationship, we see that God pulls us out of isolation. Me, 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 me. Pulls us out of that now, some of us choose to be single and unattached. Fine. It's your vo vocation. Some of us choose to be married. Some of us choose to be in other relationships. Doesn't matter. But for the reason I am alone, I need to question myself. Is it because I cannot love? Because I'm making a mistake. And I need to go in myself and end the isolation that keeps me away from people whether those people are in intimate relationships or people in the soup kitchen. So God pulls us away from isolation and says, to live, to be fully human, you've got to relate. If you're a single person, fa family person, it doesn't matter. Yesterday, speaking of family, my own, yesterday, my, little Michael received First Communion. Okay, that's my, my youngest nephew. We came out of the woodwork for him. I mean, there were so many people celebrating Michael. And as I'm looking around all day long, I was able to celebrate the Mass that St. Pius was wonderful. But as I look around at the celebration during the day, eating at this table, moving to that table, going to this group of people, I'm realizing this is God amidst us. This is God in the roast beef. This is God in the chicken. This is God in the drinks. This is God in, in the, the, the play games that the, the kids were doing. That is God. And of course, it didn't look like God as we imagine God to be, but it was God. Joy, happiness, sharing, relating, God. Yes, of course, he got the, the, the most significant part of our faith that morning, and his family as well was invited to receive the Eucharist. That keeps us nourished. That keeps us energized. We need to be fed on Jesus Christ each day. His Eucharist and his word. You can, then it all fits together. Then I can leave and go live my life and realize I'm in the presence of God. And better yet, God is in the presence of me. Boy, doesn't that change how we relate to one another? Think about the early days of, of courtship, you know, when kids first start meeting each other, the little notes, and my niece is going through that, my don't know me now, it's 15, 16 years old, you know, little notes, little boyfriend, he's not my boyfriend, he's my boyfriend. But, but all of the, the flutter that goes into that, all of the excitement that goes into that, and the heartbreak that will come, but that's another story. But think about, we've all been there. I don't care who you are, you've been there, if you are a person. You love somebody, you got odds over, over that love, whether it ended or continued or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. And then in old age, something similar happens to the courtship period, as the courtship period. Because during the courtship period, we anticipate the needs of one another. We want to be there. I want to bring the flower to her when I go see her. Or, or I'm going to look nice when he comes through the door. All those things, the anticipation of each other's needs and, and favors. That's a reflection of love. In old age, many people who are married still, still anticipate each other's needs. Mr. and Mrs. Koenig, 
anticipating each other's needs, taking care of each other. He's bringing the Eucharist to her today because she, she can't be here. How significant it is to live the Christian life and realize it's reflecting on my own life. Now, in middle age, sometimes we get a little selfish. Got to say that. Sometimes it turns out to be a me, me, me. You know, we've done the courtship, we got the wife, we got the husband, we got the kids, we got the house. Now it's time for me. Baloney. All of it was you and your spouse and your children. There's no period of selfishness in God. Sometimes we skip a skip through the courtship to the old age and we forget the section in the middle, which is so significant. Getting to know God in our mature relationships in a very special way. Jesus gives us himself and the Holy Spirit and tonight in the gospel. I say tonight because that gospel was written for the, the evening of the Last Supper when Jesus is giving us his final methods and messages and saying, oh, there's so much you got to know. You're not, you don't have the ability to understand it right now, but you'll get to know it as you develop in the faith. And that's what's going on in the gospel tonight. And for us, as Jesus gives us himself, we think of that little old lady who was very wealthy. And when she passed, all her relatives were there in the attorney's office. What am I going to get? What am I going to get? What am I going to get? And the attorney begins, being in sound mind and body, I, Mrs. Smith, have left nothing to anyone. I spent it all on myself. <laughs> That's not what Jesus did. He spent it all on us. Being of sound mind and body, he gives us his spirit forever to be united to him. So, so we can become closer to our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.